Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Jeffrey J. Fox, author of the new book, How to Be a Fierce Competitor. Stick around. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 600 archived celebrity and newsmaker interviews for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by thepartyauthority.us. Signing a wedding, mitzvah, or corporate event? For any and all occasions, call the Party Authority nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs. That's 1-800-342-5357, where one call does it all. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of unappreciative neighborhood dogs in the new new media capital of the world and home of the best team in baseball, St. Petersburg, Florida. Now, I can honestly and modestly say that I know a thing or two about fierce competitors in business. If you know anything about my background as a journalist, you probably think I'm referring to the CEOs with whom I've worked on books. Chainsaw Al Dunlap from Scott Paper and Sunbeam, Home Depot founders Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank, or Commerce Bank founder Vernon Hill. But I'm actually thinking of one of my first bosses, George Tenenbaum. George was a huge SOB, a world-class son of a bitch. <laughs> and I think he'd take pride in that description. And it's not that I didn't like or respect him either. I worked for George when I was 15, buying and selling comic books at a flea market in East Brunswick, New Jersey, and at conventions everywhere from Manhattan to Philadelphia. George treated me well, paying me fairly and feeding me decently, too. But he was a tough guy with whom to do business, especially considering the nature of his weekend business. Every transaction was a negotiation, a deal, a haggle. Buy a little, he try to sell you more. Come in to sell him your old comics, he'd talk you into taking a pittance for that prized Fantastic Four number one. He'd chase people down the aisles to get them to reconsider rejected bids. No one walked away from George Tenenbaum. But my favorite story about George was when he explained how life worked in his world. It came about when he made a mistake that cost him more than a few bucks. It was just he and I that day, and in talking to a customer, he blamed the mistake on his wife, Rhonda. When the customer left, I said, George, why did you blame Rhonda? That was your mistake. He said, Bob, let me explain life to you. When I screw up, if you're here, I blame my wife. But if she's here and you're not, I blame you. And I guarantee you that if she's here and I'm not, she'll blame everything on me. And when neither of us is here and you screw up, I fully expect you to blame me. The Harvard Business School, this was not. And this isn't one of the 60 lessons in Jeffrey J. Fox's latest book, How to Be a Fierce Competitor, What Winning Companies and Great Managers Do in Tough Times. But I don't know, I think it could be. Fox is the author of a growing series of business management books, including How to Become a CEO and How to Become a Rainmaker. He has a smart approach, producing compact how-tos that the average business person can read, absorb, and apply in the course of a plane or train ride. There we go. Jeffrey J. Fox, stranded at an auto repair shop somewhere in America. Welcome to Mr. Media. Hey, thanks. Thanks, thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. How's the, how's the car holding up? I don't know. They have it on a bay. I was driving in a little part of Connecticut, and I heard this pop, and all of a sudden I saw steam everywhere. I was so lucky to pull off the highway, and there was a very good uh, garage in Cromwell, Connecticut, uh, Cromwell Automotive. The guys are terrific, and they are fixing the car as we speak. And the guy's letting me use his office to make this landline call, which is I'm very appreciative. I'm going to send him a copy of How to Be a Fierce Competitor. He doesn't know that, but I'm going to send him one tomorrow. Well, it's it's funny on two, on two points. I, I grew up in New Jersey and had family in the, in Hartford, and uh, I remember when I was a kid, my dad always had cars that needed repair. But he always insisted that we could make the drive to Connecticut, and we would drive, and, you know, as a little kid. And the car always broke down, like, you know, 30 miles outside of Connecticut. And I remember always being stuck at some 
off the interstate <laughs> right <laughs> mechanic shop and you know oh my god so you bring back uh, well not necessarily the best memories but I'm, I'm sorry for your car however i do want to ask you um you know most business books aim high at managers and executives but what could your auto mechanic today learn from Chris competitor that would apply to what he does every day well you know it's funny this guy really has a customer first attitude um, here he is allowing me to use his phone in his private office. He's turned off all the radios. He's turned off anything that could possibly interfere with this. He is uh, uh, just as, as customer-oriented. as I've been watching him with the other uh, people that have come in. I've watched him with his employees. I mean, this guy's got it. He's putting the customer first, and that's what fierce competitors do. You know, it's a, Fierce is not you know, an animalistic kind of beast growling in the jungle. Fierce is a relentless, tireless, determined uh, marketer who wants to get and keep every customer they can. And uh, you don't have to be a bad person or a rough person or a tough person. You just have to be determined. And that's what this guy is. Hmm. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, I mean, I'm, I don't consider myself a fierce competitor. I, I think I, I go at things a certain way, but I'm not, not, not fierce. Why would I want to be? Well, again, I wouldn't use the word fierce to describe necessarily a style as much as I would an attitude. Um, You know, getting up in the morning and going to work is something that not everybody does every day on time. Um, The fierce competitors are those who put the customers first, who look at every little way they can improve their business, who are relentless about getting rid of waste, who are tireless in their pursuit of customers and innovation and that kind of thing um you know some of the greatest competitors in in the world you know you don't even hear from them they're quiet behind the scenes ceos of the 25 million small businesses in america for example you know helping their employees do their job better you can be fierce without uh, you know without uh, throwing the gauntlet at everybody so it's a it's a, it's a mindset it's an approach not necessarily a you know, take no prisoners, uh, be an asshole kind of. Thing. Well, th- that's right. It's a, it's a mindset. It's an attitude. I I know this guy that owned a um, a gravel uh, a gravel pit yard, and he, he set a goal for himself: eight truckloads a day. After he mastered that and was able to do it in eight hours, then it was ten, and then he figured out how to do twelve. That's a fierce competitor. Um. Uh, does the fierce competitor look for weakness in in in, in his competitors, his or her competitors, or oh, does yes. he just look for strength in what he what he does himself? Well, the fierce competitors do two things. Number one, they 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 pour the coals to what they do well. They they really work on their strengths. They do not work on their weaknesses, per se. But what they do do is exploit the competitor's weakness, and the competitor's weakness is usually doing something. Uh, differently than what the fierce competitor can find. For example, um, let's say you're in the retail business and your competitor is open five days a week and you decide to open six. Well, you've exploited a weakness. You've exploited the fact that the other guy is content to be open five days a week. You decide to go six. Those kinds of things. But a, but a, a fierce competitor doesn't say, let's teach the quarterback how to catch and let's teach the, the end how to pass. Instead, they teach the quarterback how to pass better. But they do exploit weaknesses. In the uh, introduction to the show, I talked about, uh, I kind of glossed over, I, I, I mentioned uh, some of the CEOs that I've worked with, and I think all of those guys, I don't, I don't know how many of them you'd be familiar with, but I think they were all very fierce competitors. Um, uh, Vernon Hill, who founded Commerce Bank, which is now owned by TV Bank, um, very interesting in terms of exploiting the weaknesses of the competition. He uh, he opened a bank that was open seven days a week, opened earlier than the other banks, and stayed open later than the other banks. Right. Um, that's right. That's what Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I was going to say. The Home Depot, they exploited uh, customer service in, inadequacies at other uh, 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 big um, hardware stores. By They had a very infamous uh, thing where, they would take back, uh, if, if you brought them something, even if they didn't sell it, they would give you the refund on it. And the most famous example of that was some guy returned four tires to a Home Depot store early in their history, and the, uh, the manager knew that the, the, their attitude was the customer was always right, 
So he took back the tires. That's the guy, what he paid for him. The guy gave him the receipt, I guess, or something. He gave him his money. The guy walked away. And they, they, they hung one of those tires up over the customer service center at the first Home Depot store to remind employees that the customer was always right. Right. And, and going the extra step for the customer, that customer obviously told other people about it, or you wouldn't know. You're telling people mm-hmm. about it. Uh, Home Depot has made, that was probably a million dollar plus plus uh, in publicity. And, and the customer knew he bought the tire someplace else. And that customer, because most customers, 99% of them are fair and decent, is going to repay Home Depot by coming back there time after time and bringing friends. The customer, treating the customers as you would treat yourself is the hallmark of a fierce competitor. Mm. Now, I, I, I also told, and this is the last self-referential comment, but I, <laughs> I, I also told the story of this guy, George Tenenbaum, who I worked for, who I, I always thought of as a very fierce competitor, but again, not necessarily very likable to people with whom you did business. It, does, it, does it matter if you're likable? Well, I, you know, I thought about that often. I see, I see many, many people who I'm surprised at their success who are not very likable. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you're not going to be in retail. You're not going to be customer-facing and all those kinds of things if people find you unlikable. They simply won't buy from you over time. That doesn't mean you can't develop a great business, hire people who can uh, sell, who can market, who can work with others, um, and you're just the driving force behind it. I think it's a lot more rare than people believe. I mean, Fortune used to have that thing, the five toughest bosses or whatever they were. And, you know, 10 years later, all those bosses are all uh, OB uh, because their enterprises failed because of their uh, flawed leadership styles. I, I think you'll find that every, every day uh, businesses around the world, and certainly in the United States, um, if you're, if you're going to depend on customers and you're the one selling them, you, you'll find ways to be nicer. I think, I, I think the, the guy I work with who that um, matches up with uh, Al Dunlap said, said, I think he had, I always thought he had a great philosophy about how to make money in business and, and how to approach things, but his personality was such that it just made everybody angry, competitors and coworkers alike. Right, and, well, and he, he, he was a serious competitor, yeah. but not a, a good one, yeah. Well, he also, he also became a caricature of himself after he saw himself in Fortune magazine as one of the toughest bosses in the world, and he destroyed Sunbeam. Uh, you know, no one wanted to work for him. The employees sabotage him a million different ways. He doesn't know it. Good suppliers would rather sell, sell their goods to any place else, and then when he needed credit, no one was there for him. So, you know, sometimes if you want to be the tough guy, you better be prepared to see how, see how it works when you don't have all the weapons. Mm-hmm. Frankly, he could have done like a lot that. better with that company. The brands were wonderful, but he chose not to. Yeah, well, he, he, you know, his thing was always to be to do a certain type of thing to come in and be a fix it, and that was the first time he stayed on to try to run a company that wasn't really his thing. Um, yeah, anybody, anybody can slash expenses and cut costs. Anybody can do that, but mm-hmm. to slash expenses and cut costs so the company grows is very hard to do. Right, right, and I, I think I think he I think he realized that after a time. Um, what what are the some of the easiest steps to become an affairs competitor? Well, I think first thing is to um, increase your selling. Uh, the, you know, in, in this, these tough, tough times, there are studies that show that corporate sales forces are making 30% fewer sales calls than they do in good times. Now, there's a lot of socially acceptable sounding excuses. The customer doesn't have the money. The customer's budgets are shot. Uh, the customer doesn't want to see me and so forth. But this is the time when you should be making 30% more sales calls. And, in fact, that's what the fierce competitors are doing. They're out there getting market share because they know that their competitors are hunkering down, have gone MIA to the market, and now there's opportunity to get. So the first and easiest thing to do is to increase selling pressure. Second thing is increase sales training, effective sales training. These are two things that are easy. Uh, Most companies cut sales training uh, in tough times. They cut innovation. They cut advertising, communication, outreach. Those are all, all big mistakes. Uh, you should be raising the commissions for the sales force. You should be finding ways, uh, you know, turn off the air conditioning in the building and let that money pay for, pay for a sales contest. Now it's the time to go get business, not wait for it to come to you. Do tough times prove um, who the actual service competitors are? I mean, it seems like in good times anybody can be 
Right. A so-called fierce competitor because the money's flowing, times are good, people have got money to spend. But in times like these, not so easy, right? Oh, that's right. The rising tide, the rising river lifts all rafts, and so does the declining river. It's in tough times that you can find out who your rainmakers are and who your who the real good, great companies are. It's interesting. Since the first recession of 1823 and then the one associated with the Civil War in 1863, 1906, when John Pierpont Morgan uh, sailed, took a train from Maryland up to New York to save the, bank, save the United States uh, debt and banking situation, and then, of course, the Great Depression, the, 50, the 12 or so recession since 1955, the data are irrefutable. Those companies that outsell, out-hustle, out-market, out, outreach their com- competition, emerge from downturns, in a stronger market share and profit position. This is an absolutely irrefutable set of facts. And some of the greatest companies in America were founded in the depths of recession. Uh, for example, General Electric, uh, E&J Gallo Winery, Disney, Microsoft. These companies were built uh, during recessions because the fierce competitors create their own economies. They often create entire enterprises and entire industries. That's why... They're not worried about economies because they influence the economies where they play. Well, um, I'll tell you what. Let's take a quick commercial break. Uh, We'll be back in a second. This is Bob Adelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with author Jeffrey J. Fox, whose new book is How to Be a Fierce Competitor. We'll be right back. Hey, did you know that you can listen to the latest Mr. Media show right on your phone with the Stitcher app? Stitcher's smart radio for your smartphone. Mr. Media is on demand and on the go with Stitcher. Download Stitcher for your phone today. Get the free app at www.stitcher.com. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R.com. Ever thought of hosting your own radio show? Now you can by registering at blogtalkradio.com. While you're there, check out our selection of premium packages. To start your own show today, visit blogtalkradio.com. Hello, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with uh, author Jeffrey J. Fox, whose new book is How to Be a Fierce Competitor. Uh, Jeff, uh, I was asking what are some of the easiest steps uh, to get started as a fierce competitor. What are the ones that, and I think you started talking about this a little bit, what are some of the ones that people screw up pretty easily? Well, the, the biggest mistake that the non-fierce competitors make is they get afraid of the marketplace, and they cut things that are customer-facing. They cut customer service. They re- they'll, instead of having a receptionist in front of the beauty salon, uh, they'll cut that person, and then they'll waste all of the barbers in the salon time trying to make appointments and all these kind of things. There's so many false savings that these uh, that these ordinary companies make. And, and, you know, they intellectually know it's a mistake. They're fighting for things like to make a quarterly number because of Wall Street and so forth instead of taking the long view. I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing uh, how many companies know they should be sending another email, writing an, sending, making another ad, doing another direct mail piece, tra- changing their menu. Move the, move the merchandise around in the store. Open a little bit later. All these kinds of things they should do, but instead they look at the cost associated with that and not the potential profit or revenues. Hmm. Well, let me ask you um, one of the things I found very interesting in your book, especially in light of some of the people with whom I work, is uh, Chapter 17, Stay Off Magazine Covers. I thought this was fascinating. I think a lot of people would find this rather counterintuitive, you're telling them don't go out and, and get yourself, uh, you know, piles and piles of PR that, that uh, I guess, uh, you know, make, uh, make the, the CEO uh, a celebrity. Talk about that a little bit. Right. Uh, it, right. A big corporation should be getting its products on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, not the picture of its CEO. When you see a company where all of a sudden the PR department or PR firms they've hired are trying to get personal publicity for the CEO, unless it's a company of one, unless the CEO is an architect or a lawyer or a consultant or something like that, where they really reflect the product, you know, where the, where the, where the person on the cover of the magazine, that's publicity not for him, for him, but it's really a proxy for the company. That's okay. Or if you win an award or something like that, that's okay. 
But to try to go out there and show how good a manager you are and all these kinds of things, like, for example, that Carly, Fior- Carly whatever her name is, Hewlett-Packard, you, know, you, could, you, could, you could predict the decline and demise of this person, the CEO, because the publicity was all about her, and it wasn't about the products. It wasn't about the customers. It was about herself. And, and, and by the way, competitors go over those articles with a fine-tooth comb because inevitably – when the article is a glowing or, or some sort of an article about a CEO, they have to balance it a little bit so they'll bring up some weakness or some negative or whatever. And there's oftentimes a picture into strategy, a picture into future plans. So it, it's, there's nothing gained by it. Put your products on the cover of the magazine, not yourself. But nobody finds products sexy other than, you know, maybe Apple products. Well, right. I mean, I mean Steve Jobs is, is kind of iconically linked to Apple. On the other hand, mm-hmm. Uh, he spends so much time getting uh, the terrific design of his products that, in fact, those products have been on the cover of Business Week and so forth as, you know, the design product of the year. Much better, much better to have a picture of the iPad, the iPhone, or whatever they are on the cover of a, a business or any kind of magazine than it has a picture of the CEO. But we're, I mean, we're kind of a celebrity culture. I mean, we... We want to see, we want to read about, now Donald Trump, I suspect, is the exception because he created his brand around himself. But, uh, you know, Bill Gates, uh, uh, Warren Buffett, and Vernon Hill, who I mentioned before, who's you know, uh, kind of a regionally known guy in the Northeast. Uh, these guys have, you know, have made brands out of themselves, um, not, and not necessarily because they were auditioning for their next job, but because they thought it was expedient to sell them what, what they had. Well, I, I think you'll find that some of those folks um, that you mentioned, I mean, they are celebrities by the dint of the enormous enterprises they've created. I mean, it's just impossible not to come to know or be interested in the greatest investor of all time, the guy that built Microsoft and so forth. But I, I can name you a hundred companies that no one knows who the head is. Who's the head of McDonald's? Who's the, who's the head of Home Depot, for example? Who's the head of, um, uh, of uh, Chrysler? Who's the head of who owns um, who owns the uh, the Montreal Canadiens? I mean, there are just thousands and thousands and thousands of businesses where the CEO and all their managers are trying to promote the products, are trying to promote the service, their value proposition, and so forth. If you get sucked into the celebrity thing and you are not the product, you have wasted company time and management time and money and resources. Mm. Now, uh, changing gears a little bit, how did you get started writing these books? There's, there's I think, 11 of them now. Yeah, and what made you think – well, I'm sorry. Uh, what made you think I have wisdom – and I'm not saying that you don't have to the question. I have wisdom from which other people can benefit. I mean, there's, you know, you, you have well, to well, have – Well, uh, let me tell you, I, I didn't – I got into it by luck, as a matter of fact. I had been putting together ideas for my kids – uh, for when they graduated from school and for the kids of my clients, the client called and say, Jeffrey, you know, so-and-so is graduating from university, doesn't listen to me. So I put together all these different ideas. And I was a trustee at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and they asked me to speak one night to 35 kids, uh, guys and gals who are graduating with varsity letters and academic achievement. And uh, they said, speak for 20 minutes, which I knew meant 10. I handed out this densely typed, untitled monograph, spiral bound, of ideas. And I said, Here's some stuff for you as you go into the big bad world. Unbeknownst to me, they started making copies for their friends, their parents, and relatives and whatnot, and all of it, most of it, some of it, got into the hand of a book packager. He called me up. He said, I think you have a book. I came up with the title, How to Become CEO. Uh, He made it look like a book for a small fee. A week later, we had an enthusiastic agent, Doris Michaels of the DSM Literary Agency in New York. Three weeks later, she sold the rights to the book to Hyperion. And when it was published, it became a uh, New York Times bestseller. It's been published in 35 languages around the world. And it started, and my, age, my editor said, do you have any other books? I said, well, I have a book on selling, and I called it How to Become a Rainmaker. Uh, that book was just selected as one of the 100 best business books ever written. I, it led to my other books, uh, How to Be a Great Boss, How to Be a Marketing Superstar, How to Make Money in Your Own Big Business. I even have a book, How to Land a Dream Job, which is a cult item among folks uh, especially uh, kids graduating from universities on how to get a job. So I, I write the books for my 
myself and for my people and for my clients. And because I want everybody to success, be successful, I don't write them, I don't write anything that I think will let them fail. My books are not nuanced, as you know. You can read them in an hour and a half. They are what, mm-hmm. uh, what is right in, in, in the business world, that part of the world I know. Uh, so I never put anything in there that I don't think is right. I don't put anything in there that's, that's even the slightly bis- a bit uh, hunched, like perhaps and maybe. I just say what it is. And those, and that's what people are looking for in this highly, in this very busy, busy world. They want to be able to read a business book like mine, backwards or forwards. You can don't the chapters are only two or three pages long. Uh, it's they're successful all over the world because of that format. There, I think there are 200 now, something like that, foreign or international editions of my book. So in every language you can think of, Bob, and people can, you know, it's the same everywhere. Everybody's busy. Everybody, you know, no one has time to read a book and. So that's why they're successful. But I, I didn't get into it, as you can tell. By, it's, by, it's purely by luck. I didn't have any kind of sort of, you know, stirring motivation to do it. But now I'm captured by it. And, and so uh, <laughs> this, this book, How to Be a Fierce Competitor, I mean, all my books I hope are timeless. I, I really do hope that because uh, the things don't change. But this book is also timely because of this entrenched uh, economic slowdown. Um, I mean, there are so many things that you know everybody knows and talks about why the economy is is sluggish. Meanwhile, back on the ranch, uh, the Procter and Gambles of the world are not sitting back; they are out there building brands, advertising, and going for it. And uh, you know, this is a wonderful time for the brave and fearless. Well, uh, we are just about to run out of time. Uh, I want to tell everybody that you can find uh, Jeffrey J. Fox's new book. How to Be a Fierce Competitor uh, at great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also learn more about Jeff's many other successful books and his consulting business, Fox and Company, at foxandcompany.com. And you can follow him on Twitter at Jeffrey J. Fox. That's all solid, Jeffrey J. Fox. Uh, Jeff, uh, thanks so much for joining us in Mr. Media today. Thank you. It was great. Wonderful. All right. Best of luck with your car. All the best. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye. And for uh, more original interviews with uh, America's top business thought leaders, you can surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com. And you can now hear Mr. Media uh, while you're on the go with Stitcher Radio. Stitcher is a free news and talk mobile application. The latest episode of Mr. Media is always available for you, no syncing needed, and no memory wasted available for your iPhone, your Palm Cree, Android phones, or your BlackBerry. And downloading is easy, so go to Stitcher.com or check out the App Store for your individual mobile phone. While you're at Stitcher, and when you've got it loaded, check out some of my favorite online radio shows, which include The Michael Mara Show, Doug Loves Movies, and Sex with Emily. And please take advantage of this great offer for Mr. Media Radio listeners. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia to get a free audiobook download of your choice when you sign up today. Again, that's audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia for your free audiobook. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman.com. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, twitter.com slash Andelman, or on Facebook, just search Mr. Media Interviews. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day and share it with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. <laughs>